Welcome to our last class here. I have uh, been passing around a, a little questionnaire that we'll use uh, in the first part of the class. If I think everyone has one now, and I put some on the chair for anyone coming in, and I have a stack here. But we'll talk about those in just a little bit. <clears throat> but um, anyways, welcome to the class seven here. <clears throat> And um, we're going to today, of course, wrap up the class and stress the part three in the book, if you've been following along. And then uh, this handout I call Alabama Rivers R, and you'll, you'll see what that means. And it's, a, it's not an exam. It's totally anonymous. And I'll explain all the rules in a bit. But I'll tell you what, it can be very helpful for a lot of people, not only me, it's not like a class evaluation. It's more uh, a survey on what parts of this class uh, have inspired you to think about a particular aspect of rivers. Okay, so we'll look at the uh, basically the seven celebrations within part three of the book, and we'll we'll talk about that a little bit, and then. Uh, just there'll be a reminder for you to do the course evaluations. So part three, uh, with this wonderful picture of Hunter Nichols on the Little Choctahatchee River down on the coastal plain, uh, is uh, mainly pertaining with uh, the question, so what, or what are we going to do about this? We've been taking our six weeks to celebrate rivers and all their many physical, chemical, and biological, and historical components. But then we come to this point, and we, we think not only about our earlier classes, like how rivers form when we did the geology, how rivers flow when we did the hydrology, how rivers are full of life when we did the biodiversity, but how rivers change. And of course, that has happened over eons. Rivers are constantly changing. And uh, if you've gotten to that part of the chapter, when I was writing that, this thought just popped in my head about uh, my high school English teacher that assigned us a quote to uh, interpret. And I got Heraclitus's quote of 500 BC, which was quoted later by Plato as saying, a man may never twice step in the same river. So of all things, I got that one. And I went home scratching my head like, what in the world could that possibly mean? You know. So I, I asked my father, and he, he scratched his head and said something about fishing. And I thought, no, you don't understand either. <laughs> and so, but anyways, uh, change is, is just a fact of life about all of life, but also in particular about rivers. They're constantly moving and changing. And we've seen that, I hope, in the class. But like a lot of things, human activities over the last couple, 300 years have greatly accelerated rates of change. For example, rates of sediment transport. Rivers naturally erode and transport their sediment, but there are very unnatural loads of uh, sediment coming into some of our streams, like this aerial view of the Dog River, uh, which is reflecting a lot of the land use change in, in urban sprawl in Mobile. This river is flowing out of Mobile and into Mobile Bay uh, in some primo manatee habitat and other biota fishes and so on. And of course, the all present uh, oil spot on our parking lots or driveways, just facts of life, you know, of human activities. Uh, one of the extension agents gave me this photo, uh, sad to say taken in Auburn, of, of uh, a housing site. The silt fence is supposed to be vertical and controlling sediment, but this worker who's cleaning out his paint brushes and buckets. As you can see, the paint and the sediment and whatever else is coming off the landscape uh, 
is going straight down the storm drain, untreated as it meets our rivers. Uh, invasive species have been a big problem uh, worldwide, but also in Alabama. Uh, aquatically speaking, there's been a lot of exotic invasives in our both plant and animal. This is Eurasian water milfoil that the TVA has spent tens of millions of dollars in herbicide dosages of the Great Lakes of the South on the Tennessee trying to control. Uh, some bass fishermen are throwing it back in as fast as they can poison it out because they call it bass grass. They think it's prime habitat and cover for their tournaments and trophy fishing. Not all anglers agree with that, but when I talk with a TVA guy that's praying and spraying his herbicide all over our reservoirs, he said, you know, there'll be some guy throwing it back in because they just love it for, for uh, fish cover. So there's all those kinds of things of public awareness and the interplay here. Um, I, I don't recall, I've, I've addressed several groups lately, but this issue of pharmaceuticals, have we yeah. talked about that? We, we did touch on that. Um, and again, I'm losing track of which group told me what, but uh, one woman who volunteers at EAMC told me that very recently there's now a bin at the information desk for receiving uh, unwanted pharmaceuticals. So we know that more and more pharmacies are doing that. And now the hospital, if you happen to go there and visiting friends or whatever, or taking a loved one out of the hospital, you know, there's a place to, to put those and keep them out of our streams. And, you know, just a reminder of, of these wonderful creatures like this Gulf sturgeon that used to come up our rivers um, and are unfortunately blocked from doing so on many. And these sturgeons are fairly rare now. They've been over harvested uh, and water quality issues, habitat issues have diminished their populations. And again, in the book, I, I like to use it because it's so helpful to me, just use your hand, the five uh, points uh, of why biodiversity diminishes uh, using the mnemonic HIPPO, H-I-P-P-O, habitat destruction, invasive species, pollution, expanding populations, and over harvesting. And those are the five major ways some of these plants and animals in our world are disappearing. And um, the general public, I think, often thinks it's mainly due to over-harvesting, over-hunting, over-fishing. And in some cases, that's true, but it's rarely true. Habitat destruction and invasive species are clearly the number one and two reasons in general why our um, flora and fauna are in trouble. So from that, you know, there's a chapter that um, is about policies, politics, public participation. And to that end, you know, I say, well, that just means politics is defined the distribution of power. Okay, that's politics. Who, who's driving the bus? So I've heard so many people come up to me, even recently, and they say, you know, I've been driving over that stream forever, and I may take a casual glance. I, I never thought about where it went, or what's in it, or is it in good shape or bad shape, or who's in charge? Who, who's responsible for that? Is that, well, I think it's the government. There's some agency out there that takes care of all that stuff, you know. Or maybe it should be me, or maybe it's this or that, you know. So that's kind of what we're talking about. And in general, there's the three big sectors of any society, government, uh, market, and civil society, or what I call the citizen voice. So, you know, maybe in a perfect world, the circles would look like that, but they're not quite of those proportions or degrees of overlap. We'd like to think there was a lot of partnerships and collaborations, and certainly there are government, industry, or business, citizen, or citizen government. There's, that's why these overlaps are here, and 
you know, then maybe there's a sweet spot where lots of things get done collaboratively. But I, again, have found it helpful to just think about these sectors and have even had exercises where, let's say, you think about your watershed or your stream and you make the circles, make them any size and any degree of overlap to describe who's driving the bus in your watershed, you know? Is it, when I've done this internationally, I did it once with a group of representatives of nine Asian countries, and the Indonesians, you know, they drew a market force circle gigantic because the palm oil industry drives everything and government's way over here, citizen voice was non-existent. Then the Chinese fellow said, well, for me, it's government this big and market is over here and the citizen voice. And then maybe the Filipinos say, hey, we had a people power revolution. The citizen voice is large. And, you know, so it's a very interesting idea, I think, and a useful exercise to maybe move those circles, just draw them out on a napkin and say, okay, your stream, your river of interest, who's driving the bus? So, and so when we get to the citizen voice part, you know, and this is where I have to stay off my soapbox, you know, this is Ali and we're not political and all of that, but I think we all can benefit about thinking about this three-pointed river solutions triangle. Again, a, a concept I was introduced to some years ago by a friend and has been very helpful. And, you know, everybody wants to take action. And, but the question of what, how and what we should do is a little more problematic, let's say. And so I, I only would contend, you know, that science, which, which asks another kind of question, not what should we do, but how do, in this case, how do rivers work? So that's where we get aquatic science. That's where we get the hydrology and the geology and even the economics and the political science and the historical perspectives and all that. It's, it's, it's uh, the work of figuring out the actual processes and, and uh, perspectives that we need. And then uh, secondly, the ethical foundation, what ought to be? And that's a fundamentally different question. Scientists can't really answer that question, what ought to be? That's left to uh, us and an ethicist or a philosopher that maybe points that out. And of course, they're all interrelated, but how many times, for example, are we or our politicians taking action based on science? You know, we can do it, so let's do it. And there's no ethical consideration, perhaps, or not enough, you know. And, and as we all know, our mamas taught us, you know, just because you can do it doesn't mean you should do it, right? So this, this gets us far along, but doesn't really give us a complete foundation for action. And likewise, if people have just a vague sense of what ought to be, and they quickly act without any consideration of a scientific or rational basis for that, you can get in trouble any, any way. You know, this is a three-legged stool. Take off a leg, you're on your back, okay? So we, it's a matter of thinking about river solutions in a scientifically-based ethical way that takes action. Because again, there's, I know folks that are bopping back and forth here till the cows go home and they don't do anything. They're always just armchair talking about it, you know? So you have to do all three and, you know, how can that be balanced? And that's where the chapter comes in, which I really stuck my neck out, personalizing your river ethic, you know? And of course, we all know the love thy neighbor phrase, you know, and how does it expand in your head if we said love thy downstream neighbor? And what does that mean, you know? Because that was the question posed in the scripture. Who is my neighbor, you know? so. Uh, what does it mean to personalize our river ethic, shore up here, and of course, shore up here, but so that these solutions are, are more balanced and based. So anyways, that leads us to your handout. And in order to develop or personalize your river ethic, and by the way, that, that might seem to be you know, a bizarre term, like what is a river ethic? And it's really, obviously, just a subset of your ethic, your, your code, your life uh, rules of behavior, if you will. 
and it, it can come from very traditional sources, your upbringing, your teachers, your preachers, your readings, your, your life experiences, your reason, and, and it leads to, uh, I hope, uh, a deeper uh, ethical sense. And so we're going to do it for, for rivers. So, you know, I kicked around these celebrations, so-called, um, and there are seven. These are the seven. And so on your handout, and I had meant to email you about having a, a book or something to write on, but you just have to circle one little number, so hopefully you have a writing utensil. If you need one, maybe a neighbor can share one with you. But um, these will be anonymously done, but I sure would love to have your perspective. You know, mm -hmm. if we had, you know, however many are here, each responding to this, after six weeks of us being together in this class, I think um, we would all learn something. And I would hope I could share the results with you. So anybody need a pen? I got one in my pocket. I have two in my pocket. You guys all set? You need one? Yeah, I'll toss you one. Yeah, another one? You need another? Okay, you all set? Everybody all set? Okay. No, no, I'm going to go, I'm walking you through each one now. So, and this will serve as a course um, review. So, and uh, it'll take us to our break. And then maybe we'll open it up. Because see, there's no answers that Alabama Rivers are. I'm not asking you to fill in the blanks. I, I'm going to give them to you and explain them. So does anyone need a handout? OK, everybody's got one. So here, here we go. And remember, you will circle the, in order of importance. Number one is your first choice, OK, or the very important. And number five is unimportant. Now, again, anonymous. And you don't have to circle one on everyone just to make me happy, OK? You do, <laughs> you do, do it, really. It's just based on your values and beliefs. Maybe they've been changed by this class, and maybe they haven't. But it's just a matter of you, when you think about all these, to say, how important is this to me, really? And not just you know my better self, but me now. <laughs> so. Rivers are full of life. Now, is that a very important ethical consideration for you or not so important? So you just kind of slide it down and just um, on, your, on your form there uh, designate. I think it says put an X by the number, right? OK. Circle? Yeah, yeah. See, there's a little cell there for you to do it. You can do it either way or do both. I don't care. But, Anyways, um, as far as full of life, we're, we're talking about our very special biodiversity in Alabama. And we've, we've chosen individual species each week to talk about in each river and the broad overview of uh, the state's biodiversity. And we mentioned how we are pretty much in the bullseye of this amazing uh, graphic which just points out fish diversity, the number of species of fish approximately in each of these basins. And, and you know, for a variety of reasons that we discussed, geological and climate and solar radiation and Gulf of Mexico and disturbance and all of that, we are, we are in this bullseye. So that's you know, in a nutshell, a review of that. Rivers, our rivers are full of life. So you've, you've selected that one. Okay, so the second one, rivers are ancient and physically diverse. So some of you have approached me, you've been really turned on with geology and thinking about all these rocks and fossils and the way our shifting land has changed and affected rivers in their flow direction, in their physical nature as far as waterfalls and shoals and rocky bottom versus soft bottom or their water quality, their ability to support life, uh, and so on. And you saw these three views of 
Alabama, the so-called stage on which these river actors flow. And, you know, the 100 plus rock outcrops that we have, how that reflects geological eras and how the landforms and, and the resulting vegetation and soil types are a result of that. So, sure, sure. In, it, in Florida? Flomaton. Flomaton, yeah. Right there at the edge of Florida. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I wondered if there was anything geologically that they missed. Yeah. I don't know if they're doing any fracking or anything down there. Mm -hmm. I read a little article about that. It is very unusual. There, not only are there large tectonic plates, but there are fragmented plates. And what I read was there was a slippage of a plate. It was a geological event, very slight. And they also mentioned that during some human activity previously, uh, be it fracking, there's not much fracking to my knowledge there, but there was some uh, explosions, you know, for whatever reason, that caused some of these in the past, usually, you know, low on the Richter scale. This one was only like a... Yeah, three. Yeah, it rattled some dishes, but uh, I think they said it was. <laughs> huh? You know, it might be small right now, but it's something happening. But yeah, it's happening. Yeah, I remember once in Pennsylvania, I was I was in bed. My wife and I were still sleeping, and we had four little kids, and the louvered doors on the closet started rattling. Do, 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 do. We thought, did one of those kids get trapped in the closet? <laughs> we got up, and it was an earthquake. You know, my garage window fell out, and all that. So they happen anywhere, but this one was, uh, according, maybe some of you know, but it was a geological. It was a plate slippage. And just as an aside, uh, I never really got into that. But one thing that helped me to understand this a while ago. I was talking to a geologist. You know, the plate, that, the large North American plate, people say, well, where, where would that plate start? You know, and say, well, it starts on our east coast and ends on our west coast. But in fact, it starts out in the middle of the Atlantic, and it ends on the west coast where it's subducting. So that means if this is the North American plate, Alabama sits right about in the middle of it. Because this is way out in the middle of the ocean. So if this was a, a sheet, it is a sheet, if it was a piece of metal or wood, you know, as the plates move, we're the one, the middle is the one that goes up and down the most, right? So if you think about it, we, we are vulnerable to shifts. We're not on the circle of fire like Californians, you know, ready to have the big earthquake. But we do have a lot of movement simply because we are almost in the center of our plate. So when it gets hung up, you know, think about shifting a piece of plywood over your driveway. It's going to get stuck on a rock. And then if there's more tension, it'll bow, it'll bow, it'll bow. So we're, we're in that situation where being, being in the middle, we, we have subsidences and uplifts maybe a little more than our neighbors to the east and west. OK, so um, this I just found this Wendell Berry poem that pertains to our geology. The river is of the earth, and it's free. It is rigorously embanked and bound, and yet it is free. To hell with restraint, it says, I have got to be going. I will grind out its dams. It will go, I, it will go over and around them they will become pieces. This is Wendell Berry. <laughs> um, and, you know, I've always thought if I had a choice of being in a water balloon fight or a rock fight, I'd probably take the water balloons. But if given 100 million years, I know that water will win. The river will grind everything to powder or silt or sand. Um, you just have to give it enough time. And that's that's the name of his poem, Give It Time, okay? So maybe not today, maybe not in our lifetime, but sooner or later, water wins, okay? Uh, okay, so 
that's the ancient and physically diverse. You've, you've had some angles on what that all means. And as far as your river ethic, like if someone says, why are rivers important or why do you care? That would be the second one. The third one, beautiful and mysterious. So it goes more to the aesthetic side, the spiritual side. And, you know, sometimes just a photo, like Beth Maynard Young's river pictures, they just evoke such emotion, you know, and it, it, it just is like, that river should never be trashed. You know, it's just for that reason alone, you know, the beauty and mystery of it. And, you know, there's a set of paintings. I've, I've gone on search of these, and I've found them. The, the Thomas Cole uh, lived in the early 19th century. He founded the Adirondack School of Painting, which, which was largely biblical allegories. Uh, with using the natural world. And he did this series of Voyage of Life. It's a set of four paintings. And if you're ever in DC and you go to the National Galleries, go in the front door, make a sharp right, and he has his own room with his four paintings, one on each wall. It's a small room. And these are stunning paintings. They're huge. Uh, and I did a little backstory on him. He actually got sued or there was some dispute over these paintings and if the benefactor owned them or he did. So he kind of said nuts to you and he made another set which are in Elmira, New York at an, where he apparently lived for a time. So Jen and I went to Elmira searching for them and they were traveling. So we didn't see them there but we have seen them in DC. But the point is, you know, as far as rivers being beautiful and mysterious and uh, spiritually enriching. Cole, in about, I don't know, 1820, 1830, had this voyage of life. This is the first panel, childhood, and the little babies in this gondola coming out of the spring. And of course, it's beautiful, and it's dawn, and the angel is hovering over, and it moves to youth, which is where the angel, for whatever reason, said, I'm getting off here, see ya, have a good life, you know? <laughs> and, and he's like, good, I got the world by the tail, I got the castles in the sky, and we're in about a second order stream here, okay? So now we're going down the river, and this is all, you know, thinking about life. Look at what the flowers have done, they've died off, but he's, he's all optimistic. Then we come into, maybe where we are or we, where we have been in the last few years, uh, adulthood or manhood. And here, you know, the angel's way up here, the clouds are dark, and you're ready to get into some major uh, class five rapids here. And all you can do is pray, you know, you're, you're the proverbial upstream without a paddle, you know? And that's all you can do. And so you think about it. I see people nodding. Yeah, that's my life. Um, <laughs> and then finally, his fourth panel, the old man with the boat all beat up, the, the, the front part is just busted off. But now the angels are descending to escort him uh, to glory. And he's in this peaceful, quiet, you know, estuary. So just thinking about the river as an allegory of life, and there's a lot of poetry, um, there's a lot of art that depicts that. So beautiful, mysterious, and I added in the chapter spiritually enriching. So please rank that on a one to five. So number four, they're a part of Alabama history and culture. And I hope you got a mega dose of that, you know, even from some of our first classes. These are our seals in 1819 and now in our bicentennial year, 200 years later. And you know the backstory, there was a symbol in between, a seal that was taken uh, away in the 30s to give us back our river map seal and what that really signifies and how our history and our culture and our sense of place have been defined by rivers, our 132,000 miles of streams, you know, define us as a river state, unlike some of these uh, Great Lakes states that are predominantly uh, lakes and very few uh, long rivers like we have, and what that meant uh, for who we are. 
So that's just a touch of you know how it has affected us, uh, how people in Alabama define themselves through rivers. Next one, rivers are a key to Alabama's economy. This one's kind of interesting. I, this Friday, the day after tomorrow, I'm heading to the coast. The Alabama Rivers Alliance is the kind of the umbrella group in Alabama for all the river groups. So Alabama Water Watch or Sierra Club types or the eight river keepers we have in the state and a lot of our smaller um, groups, you know, Lake Watch of Lake Martin, Save Our Sagahatchee, locally. Uh, and there are hundreds, literally hundreds of groups in the state. Alabama Water Watch has worked with over 300 in the last 27 years. Uh, many, many creeks have the friends of X Creek, you know, and, and most of our reservoirs have at least one, some three, four, or five uh, homeowner, boat owner associations, or uh, Lake Watch type groups, and it's been a great privilege for me to work with them over the years. Uh, but my point, the theme of this year's water rally, it's held at Camp Beckwith in Fairhope, is Alabama's water economy. And I've been asked to speak to that. My talk is Alabama's water economy and the growing citizen voice. So I've been kicking that around quite a bit and you're, you're receiving some of that now, in fact. But um, we, we do know that even from Paleo-Indian times on up through early settlement and into the modern age, that our rivers have been quite important uh, as means of transportation, getting to market, driving mills, uh, hydropower dams, and on and on. And now the modern uh, waterfront home economy, I've heard that the average housing start on Lake Martin now is pushing a million dollars. Uh, and I read recently, maybe you did too, uh, it was just day before yesterday, they did a survey of the changing demographics in America. Anybody see that? Uh, there's several states that have out-migration, net loss now. Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Ohio, they're losing. And then it had the states that are gaining. And it, and it said the number one state for in-migration, do you know what it might be? It's Alabama. It's Alabama. Go look it up. It's amazing. And a lot of it is the automobile industry. Uh, the people that are in-migrating, uh, want a high quality of life. A lot of them are professionals. They, they want to experience the great outdoors. They want to fish. They want to swim. Yeah, Bill. That uh, number of people coming in relative to the current population. Yes, it is. It's relative. Because um, Utah, I think, was number two. And there was another state that was, well, the point is, it's relative, because there were some with more people coming in, but a, a smaller percentage of their population. So we just, I think, crossed the five million mark. So, you know, um, it's, it's getting big and, and crowded, maybe. I don't know. I remember coming out of Pennsylvania. I, that's where we moved from. And I, I went to the Atlas. Pennsylvania is slightly smaller than Alabama, but it has three times the number of people because of Pittsburgh and Philly mainly. But it's a much more populous state, even though it's just Alabama turned on its side, you know. That's, it has very similar dimensions, but yeah. <laughs> So anyways, this is a fairly recent Landsat satellite image of Alabama. And by that, you know, they can then enhance it and red is urban, uh, green is mainly forest, both, both natural and plantation. Uh, yellow is ag, uh, row crop and pasture. Um, and then of course blue, light blue are wetlands and dark blue is standing water. Visible from, uh, hey, what is it? Lens that flies. Very high up, okay? <laughs> Every 16 days it goes over and takes pictures. Uh, and so this is a neat 
shot of Alabama, maybe a different perspective. We talked about this black belt, this agricultural uh, rich soil here, and the Tennessee Valley, of course, tremendous amount of ag there, largely due to those alluvial soils created by that river. There's the Sipsi Wilderness and Bankhead National Forest, very dense. Here's the Talladega National Forest on uh, Mount Chiha area and so on. But the point is, you know, the way settlements along the fall line, we've talked about Phoenix City, Auburn, Montgomery, Tuscaloosa, the Shoals, you know, have, a, have determined that. And anyways, uh, our economy, where and how we settled and how we've used rivers have been very um, important. So defining our economy, rank that one. Okay, second to the last, precious and provide vital ecological services. So um, this one, on the precious side, we can look at it globally, and we often in water education programs say, what if all the world's water was in a liter bottle? You know, and then we go from there. And making a long story short, 97% of that, so 900, is it 970 milliliters, all but 30 mils, which, you know, fits in a little yeah. beaker, uh, is salt water. So 97% is off the table for human use. Then you take this 30 mils and you start going down, well, there's all this in the atmosphere. And these are, this is in very, very deep groundwater, inaccessible. And this is tied up in ice, which is gigantic, by the way. Most of that last 30 mils is in ice. So then you come to the Great Lakes with 20% of the world's fresh water, Lake Baikal in Russia, the most, the most voluminous. Uh, we used to say Lake Tanganyika was the deepest. It's about 1,600 feet deep. Uh, now they've found a hole in Baikal that they say it's 1,602 feet deep. So anyways, the bottom line is you take the Nile, you take the Amazon, you take the, and all of that accessible surface fresh water from the one liter is less than two drops in the palm of your hand. So it's very, very precious. I mean, our fresh water globally is very, very precious. And then to say that it provides these vital ecological resources some people look at that and say, ah, swamp, drain it, you know, we need to do something with that. That, those backwaters, those wetlands, those channels are biologically degrading waste. They are, you know, mitigating flooding and drought. Uh, they, they are doing things for free that is, are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And the more we destroy them, the more we'll take over the cost that they've been <laughs> covering for us, right? So you say, well, well, we'll take away this and then we'll have economic activity here. Well, then you'll pay, you know, maybe 20 times more than that activity gained you. So it's a matter of thinking about ecological services. And even, even locally, uh, we, we showed you this with our five surrounding watersheds where Auburn and Opelika you know, in the high ground, straddle these. And you just better believe, you know, for drinking water, for wastewater treatment and all that, those, those ecological services of our rivers are very, very important to us in our, in our quality of life. So that is number six, okay? Got that one ranked? And then finally, uh, some would say, is that a celebration? But I make a case that it is. It's vulnerable. Rivers are vulnerable and need our care. And we, we cannot take them for granted. They will change in ways we don't want if the citizen voice, the voice of government, the voice of, of market forces is not clear and committed to um, seeing that these rivers maintain some level of integrity, biological, physical, uh, cultural integrity. And so then from that point, and uh, we'll just let you do one more thing, then we'll take a little stretch bake and then wrap it up, is um, for you now on the left margin, you see 
that there's a ranking of the seven. So now, independent of how you ranked each one, just uh, rank them in order of importance uh, of the seven. So for example, someone could have put all number fives for each one, or all number ones, or any combination. But now, I'd like you to rank them in their order of importance to you. So if economy's number one, put it number one. You know, if uh, biota, full of life, and so on. So that will be just one, uh, you know, each one only gets one number, one through seven. So rank those, and then uh, when you're done and you step up for a stretch, you know, just put them here on the stage, if you will. And, you know, we'll see you back, we'll meet back about, in about 10 minutes. And, and Harold, yeah, yeah, okay. A uh, couple questions, but one thing I was gonna do at break is uh, Harold has a very brief announcement. Long leaf, right? Long lolly. Oh, long lolly. Oh, okay. Sorry. I, I know that's a touchy point yeah. with you. <laughs> okay. And there were one or two other questions or comments. Any? Sure. Those were the seven. And and by the way, maybe I neglected to say this when you were filling them out, you know, just for reinforcement. You were just supposed to write in the, fill in the blank. Alabama rivers are blank, full of life, you know, blah, 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 blah. So if you haven't, uh, just, just put these terms in on each so that I know what you were ranking. And these, these are in, in chapter 13, is it? I believe it's 13 on the personalizing your river ethic chapter. So you can review them and get a lot more background on each. Yeah, yeah, just sit on here. And we'll see you back in, you know, five or 10 minutes. Okay, very good, we'll get, get started again. Thanks a lot for doing these surveys. Are there any overall comments about them? Anybody have any thoughts or uh, ideas or comments about the survey you just did? Did it get any juices flowing or help you think through? <laughs> because it, when, it, when you hit cold with it, you often think, oh, what is he talking about? You know, but um, I think it's something worth developing, you know, so we're not just saying, jumping up and down and saying this should be done or that ought to be done. What is, what's the basis? What's the science behind it? What's the strategy behind it. And this weekend, this, this water rally, the thing I like about it so much is it brings in pretty much everybody, you know, that is working on a daily basis of, for river protection and restoration. And there's, there's many different angles. Conservation Alabama comes in more as a group that lobbies legislatures uh, for good water policy. And the Southern Environmental Law Center comes in for those that, you know, carry a little litigious punch for uh, folks that aren't behaving. I, I copied some of you today. There was a uh, release, a news release today that with all this uh, heavy rain we've had, Fulton County in Georgia has released something like 20 million gallons of raw sewage to the 40, 40 okay 40 million to to the Chattahoochee River and you know that's where it flows yeah this is pre-treated but that's you know when I was a young and in Pennsylvania diving in the Susquehanna River we hated to make our dives in August because the bottom of the river was covered in corn and you just didn't want to know where that corn was coming from, but you know where it was coming from. It had already gone through people. So, you know, and I'd be down there on the bottom saying, why have I taken this job? But anyways, uh, 
that used to be, you know, pretty standard. But nowadays, when we talked about how rivers change, particularly as urban areas get paved and impermeable, like I've heard it said in Birmingham, uh, a little over an inch of rain in Birmingham today will blow manhole covers two feet off the ground and start a geyser of raw sewage in low-lying areas. There's, no, there's nowhere for that water to go. And our aging infrastructure, the sanitary sewer and the storm sewer are often in the same ditch. And one, the storm sewer leaks into the sanitary sewer and overwhelms its capacity to conduct water. So therefore, it, it backs up and creates old faithfuls at all the manhole covers. And we've gotten lots of pictures of that. So that's just a big challenge for cities, especially Rust Belt cities or aging infrastructure cities. You can imagine the monumental task of fixing that with all these modern buildings on top of it. But Mm -hmm. systems. One of the things they did is they took and put the TBIs up, 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 up tunnel boring machines like TBM and drilled like a 25 foot tunnel under the north, the south of Atlanta and used as a way of sort of holding a lot of the sewer sewage mm. amazing. Yeah. Wow. That's quite a lot of engineering. Well, on the other side, it, it's one of these, you know, it's funny but not so funny, is that you remember about 10 years ago maybe reading, if you re look at the Atlanta Journal-Constitution or whatever, Atlanta was being fined something like two or three hundred thousand dollars a day. And until they cleaned up their wastewater problem, maybe before the tunnel, I don't know, but there was a major problem. They made significant progress in doing so, and as a result, I'm over here in fisheries, and our fisheries biologist that studied West Point Lake downstream of Atlanta said, you know what, it takes two years longer for a bass to go into legal size, and about four years longer for it to get trophy size. And why was that? Because they were receiving less nutrients mm -hmm. from Atlanta. And there were actual river towns like West Point saying, hey, our local economy rests on bass tournaments. Could you guys please flush a little more, <laughs> not, not less? You know, this was, this was how economics and environment all interrelate. But in fact, by cleaning up the river, it slowed the growth, once it's processed, you know, when you get down 20, 30 miles, and it's just orthophosphate and nitrogen and all this good stuff that plants need, and it stimulates the food chain, but uh, to say nothing of metals or toxins or, you know, whatever, but yes? I'm thinking about the, on your early slide, the three circles. Yes. There will be. There will be. More so on the green circle, <laughs> the citizen voice circle. But there's always, you know, Alabama power guys and some and chem industry guys. And in fact, there's a panel of economists talking about Alabama's water economy. So, but I'm coming back to the circles in just a minute. Um, okay, quick announcement. Uh, I left this picture up because I was, I called the Cahaba River Society a couple days ago. I was up in Birmingham, and um, they have an art exhibit at the Avena Institute, which I thought, who are they? But it's the cosmetic people that do the shampoo and all that. And they're over in the Galleria. They have this big, nice building like the museum, and it's all the Avena Institute. But they. They are sponsoring an art exhibit, and um, you know the proceeds are benefiting the Cahaba River Society, and the winner gets 
the artist gets 500 bucks from the Avena Institute and all that. And last year they raised almost $18,000 for the Cahaba River Society, which has these amazing uh, tours and educational programs for the Cahaba River. So I was on their website and realized that I can fulfill one of my bucket list items because I signed up Janet and me to go on their moonlit Cahaba River float. So they're going through this in canoes on May 12, which is Mother's Day. But um, there were some openings. I got two. They said it's filling up fast. But if you are at all interested, go to the Cahaba River Society website, and there's a way to register. If not that one, they're, they're, they do other programs throughout the year. But this is going to be kind of a naturalist guided tour. So I hope to see the sphinx moths that pollinate these things at night. And, you know, just there's something about 20 acres of Cahaba lilies glowing in the natural moonlight to kind of rock your socks. So, um, and, it, and it's shallow. Um, it's, I don't know if you can get a sense of that, but it's typically less than knee deep. So there's a lot of wading, uh, you know, just with tevas or whatever. Bring your cameras in and out of the boat. Just enjoy the evening. And so you might want to look. There's so many other groups and programs like that to, to get out and experience these rivers. Yeah. He, no, they provide everything. They, yeah, uh, that that I sent out. Yeah, that I sent out. For, like if we do a float, I'm gonna. Um, I don't know. I don't want to fill your email box if you're not at all interested. But I don't have a sign up sheet. I was going to have a sign up so I could do a doodle poll if you're interested in some float trips during break. You know, I hope to hit some streams and would like to um, invite anybody if you want to go. And I have, I don't know, three or four boats. And over at Auburn Rec, if, if you're at all associated with the university, you can sign out boats and canoes and kayaks very cheap. And so that's a resource. It's right over the, by the Recreation and Wellness Center. Uh, and they, you can get tents and all kinds of stuff. They're trying to encourage the Auburn student and faculty staff community to get outdoors more. So, but this one of the Cahaba River Society, I think it's 30 bucks or something. And they provide life vest, boats and paddles, a guide, the whole nine yards. You just show up. And so to me, it was very reasonable. They're put in at West Blockton. And I didn't get the details about where they start. They may start at the Cahaba River Society offices in Birmingham, or they may start, it's a, it's a preserve. You know, it's a, what do they call that? The Cahaba, it's like a national preserve. It has another name. It's, it's protected, federal and state, you know. But, um, and then there's the Cahaba Lily Festival, which is done by West Blockton in mid-May. This is the 12th of May. But mid late May is when they're blooming. So, and we might even try a float on the Tallapoosa. There's a shoal with some Cahaba lilies. Uh, if you put in at the 49 bridge going to Horseshoe Bend State Park, just before you cross the river, there's a, there's a public access ramp. And you can put a boat in there and float down to a takeout about a three, four hour float, depending on how much you stop. You take out a Jaybird landing. So, you know, go up there with a couple of vehicles and that's a very nice float. It's a real nice float. I've done it in inner tubes, kayaks and canoes. Good float, good float. Very close. No one knew it. I didn't know it was a long canoe that had been put and had a keel. You don't know that. Right. You don't Right, right. Yeah, and the other thing, you know, with the USGS gauges, you can check the flow on any gauge stream. And, and um, I think I told you I have it on my phone for Sagahatchee, but it gives me my sweet spot. I say, when it's more than this and less than this, let me know. 
and it sends you a text every day that that river's in that spot you want. So the whitewater kayakers, they want a little higher, I want a little lower, but I don't want to walk or, you know, put in a boat with a keel and get banging around on the rocks. So you can, you can easily go online and get, uh, get text messages for your favorite float spot. So you don't have to drive so far and say, oh, it's way too high or it's too low. Okay, so I just wanted to cover a few things as we wrap up and I'll, I'll just open it up. If there's not a comment, I'll just keep moving. But these were kind of uh, statements that were scattered throughout the course and the book. I mentioned this idea about people divide and water connects and I hope you know, by seeing the Mobile Basin here, you can see how interconnected we are. And I call it the grand integrator because there's really, you know, it, it connects everything. Everything on land and water somehow manifests itself there. But um, any, any thoughts or comments on that? You don't have to. I'm just giving you opportunity here. So that's, that's yes. Well, he's talking about the Mobile Tensaw Delta right yeah. there. It's about a 10 by 40 mile piece of braided delta. How does that compare? I guess I'm thinking of the Okefenokee Lake having similar. It's already a national park. Right, it's already a national park. Uh, you know, I, I would only say this has a lot more flowing water. Yeah. Uh, and I believe this is much more biodiverse. Mm -hmm. So I guess Wilson has a biophilia center. I haven't been to, but it's somewhere over around Tallahassee. Has anyone been to that? It's fairly new. It's called, you know, he wrote a book called Biophilia, which is, you know, the human attraction to life and biodiversity. And uh, that's a stop I want to do too sometime, but it's in the panhandle there. I think it's over by Eglin. Has anyone visited that? The Biophilia Center? E.O. E. E. Wilson. He, uh, Wilson is a, is a Mobile native. Actually, he lived in Birmingham and Mobile, but he went on to be a renowned Harvard biologist, and he's called the father of biodiversity. He's he's, they just did an anniversary edition of his, he won the Pulitzer. I mean, he, he wrote The Naturalist, uh, he wrote a lot. He's an ant specialist too, a mycologist. He wrote. A, he's the father of sociobiology. I mean, he he is renowned, and um, he claims he found the fire ant first in in North America because he knew every ant in his backyard growing up, and he and he saw by name, literally. So he knew he was different. And when he got up there in Boston and they all made fun of his Alabama accent, he said, we call them far ain'ts down home because they come from far away and they ain't going away soon. <laughs> That's a far ain't. <laughs> It is, but you read the same book I did. When you read Harriet Jacobs' book, we just read Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl. And in her account in 1840, she's up in this hiding place in this attic, and she said these small ants were just stinging the stew out of her, and she was like burning. And I thought, she's the one who found the first fire, you know? <laughs> I mean, there are other red ants that bite, but she was talking about a pin-sized stinging ant. And I just wonder, Wilson says he did it, but who knows? He's the first one that wrote about it, maybe. But I don't know. When I read that, I wondered. OK, here's, here's another one. This gets a little more philosophical. The condition of the river is the conscience of the community, and it never lies. Now. It's kind of related to the first one. But here's the deal, you know. If somebody drives into your town and your river's full of trash and sewage and 
you know, there's very little life that should be there. Who's that a reflection on? That's you. That's, that's your community's conscience. And you, you try to cover it up like nobody knows what I'm putting down my sink at night. Well, in fact, water being the grand integrator, sooner or later, that will show up. And I've been to places in the world where it's, it's just deplorable. I mean, the Guayabamba River outside of Quito takes the raw sewage of 10 million people and you can smell it from a mile away. And it flows right into Colombia. I don't know why the Colombians put up with it, but it's death. It's actually absolutely anoxic. It's just black, stinking water. And it's a it was a gorgeous river. If you go above Quito, it's a beautiful river. But they've completely trashed it, you know? And, and you just, and, and let's do the flip side. If you're living where the water is great, you know? The, the river's clear, so is your conscience, right? You kind of look at it like the river being a conscience. So it's just something to think about. You can't, you can't fake it either. Okay, here's, here's the last one, I think. If you're going to take care of your heart, or a plant, or a river, you better think about the small vessels. So here's the deal. I, I deal with these Lake Martin people, and Mitchell, and Lewis Smith. Oh, it's our lake, protect the lake, you know, screw everybody else, this is our lake, don't take our water, you know. And you say, well, what is your knowledge of all the feeder streams and all of that? Well, I don't really care about that, my pontoon boat can't go up there, you know. But that's like saying I want to take care of my heart, and I don't care about cholesterol or carotid arteries or capillaries, you know. But that's where it's brewing, that's where it starts, you know. The small vessels, if you want to grow a nice tree or your broccoli, you know, if you don't know root health or the venations of the leaves that carry all those nutrients down, produce the sugars or bring the minerals and water up, everything, it's, it's like a fractal kind of pattern of nature. There's just small vessels feeding into large vessels. It's, you can see it in the natural world, in your own body, in all vegetation and in rivers. So that's my, my case for really looking at the stream in your backyard, you know, because collectively that determines the fate of Lake Martin or uh, Mobile Bay or the Gulf of Mexico, you know. So it's, it's like a lot of things. It's the subtle uh, cumulative effect that determine the outcome. Okay, so, got a few minutes here. Um, this is my Earth Day pin. I got this in 1970. On the edge right there, there's the date. I was going to take a picture to prove it. But it's just kind of amazing that a year from this April will be the 50th anniversary of, of me wearing that pin, actually. <laughs> kind of set my course. But when I was taking my first ecology course in 1970, it just coincidentally was the first Earth Day. And the prof gave us a Greek word, oikos, okay? And some of you say, well, that's the yogurt I had for lunch, but <laughs> it's more than just yogurt, okay? Oikos is a Greek word meaning taking care of the home, oikos. And it has other deeper senses or translations, the home, the family's property, or the heritage of the generations. That's oikos. And it, it's kind of a key word. You know, this is our heritage. And so taking care of the heritage. And it is eco, it is the word root of economy and ecology. So if you look at those and you think, for anyone to say, well, we have to trash this river for short-term economic gain or our bottom line, you know. That, that's not economy in the true sense of the world, word. That's, I call it insanity, or I call it arrogance or ignorance or greed or something else. But the thought that you disregard the natural world for the green stuff, you know, it's just, that's not oikos, you know. <laughs> So that, that stuck with me, and I just wanted to share that. Um, here's an interesting Oikos story. Just came out before Christmas. 
This little guy is the pygmy sunfish, lives up in the Tennessee Valley in Alabama. And it was in big trouble. So what happened? The ecologist, meaning the Center for Biological Diversity and the Tennessee Riverkeeper, went to Mazda that were setting up a new plant in Huntsville, and they made a deal. And Mazda put $6 million down and set aside uh, a nice track of these streams that feed into the Tennessee River. And, you know, doing the right thing. And this fish will probably make it because of that. So to me, that's Oikos, OK? So it's a neat, it's a neat success story. They did not always end pretty like this. And this one story is not over. But that's an endemic fish, you know, one of our 320-some. And now here's, here's where uh, the corporate or the market voice speaks for rivers, right? So they're, they're stepping up. And that's kind of a neat thing. So it, just to end with uh, who's, who speaks for rivers? You know, if you're the little kid with the first fish or the, or the big kid that never stopped fishing <laughs> or you're a river kid, the extension program's effort to help kids feel comfortable on the water or you never gave that up either and you're still floating or you're an environmental educator getting kids interested in streams or you're a water monitor, like our Ali originator, Mary Burkhart. If you're a Dick Bronson on Lake Martin that worked a decade to get Lake Martin designated as a treasured lake, or if you're part of the voiceless, you know? We just finished, of course, Voices for the Voiceless, right? And these critters, of course, and the river itself has a, a voice, per se, but you can speak for these. And so I'm just going to wrap it up with hoping that this class has helped us think in our bicentennial year, you know, that we can find these science-based ethical action items that support our heritage and the oikos. So thank you.